Dear students, welcome to this tutorial on logit models. I'm going to introduce some of the concepts here briefly to try and prepare you better for the lecture. We'll talk a little bit about the model, the criterion function, which is a likelihood function, some of the features that we're interested in for this model, and a few specific issues, namely the IIA restriction or the independence of irrelevant alternatives. So what we'll be talking about is random utility models is kind of the general frame Oops. and uh, within that set of models we have two classes we talk about conditional logit models and multinomial log uh, logit models and there can be some models that have uh, both of these two features but we'll generally be making the distinction between these two to have an overview of the types of models we are using here what we observe yi is an outcome that's the maximizer over a discrete set of alternatives of some utility. So in other words, you can think of the discrete set as being cars. There's cars 1, 2, 3, and up to capital J. Maybe there's 300 cars you're considering. And you have some utility for each of these cars. The way we're going to formalize this model of the utility you get is there's going to be a part that we observe and a part that we don't observe. Epsilon. The part that we don't observe, we're going to assume is IID extreme value type 1, which is a new type of distribution we haven't talked about before. It's a very convenient one. And this component, the component that we observe, we're going to make that dependent on data that we observe and parameters, and we're going to try and find those parameters. So that's the idea. So the two classes are the conditional logit, looks like this, xj beta and the multinomial logit is xi beta j. So the primary difference here is that in these, in the conditional logit models, x varies over the cars, the alternative, so you can think of horsepower and car price and weight, and betas are constant. There's a constant marginal utility of an additional unit of horsepower. Whereas in the multinomial logit class, the x's are uh, individual specific, so it may be a person's work distance. And uh, having a longer work distance loads differently on each of the alternatives. So perhaps having a longer work distance may mean that you like the big car, uh, the luxurious car more, because you'll be driving a lot. Could also be that you'll enjoy the green, more fuel efficient car more because uh, it'll allow you to travel cheaper. Uh, but in any event, the betas vary over alternatives and the x's vary over individuals but are constant over the alternatives. So that's the distinction between the two types of cars. And obviously you can mix these two together and you could also en envision having a mix, uh, an interaction of these two so that fuel efficiency may be more important for uh, poor consumers, for example. Turns out that when we've made the assumption that epsilon is IID extreme value, we can derive the, the probability that an individual, an individual chooses alternative D as the exponential value of this term V for that alter, alternative D here, VID, divided by the sum of exponential values of V. So, in other words, since these sum over all of the alternatives, then the choice probabilities are going to sum to 1 when we sum over, uh, over the D here, over all of the alternatives. So that's one nice feature. Secondly, we can see that the la larger this guy is relative to all the other guys, the larger is the probability of choosing that, guy, that car. So in other words, higher utility of one car means higher probability of buying it. We'll talk a little bit more about in the class why this uh, particular form comes about. Let me just get rid of that message here. All right, so uh, in conditional logit, the x's are the characteristics of the alternatives, as I said, and an example being a car choice where x would be price and horsepower. There's no normalization in this one but we cannot have an intercept in X. We'll talk about why that is in the class. 
And the interpretation of the betas is that it's the marginal utility of each of the characteristics. In the multinomial logit, the x's are the characteristics of the individuals. An example for car choice, x would be income, work distance, and so on. And in this case, we can actually have a, an intercept, but we will have to normalize one of the alternatives so that for one of the discrete choices, say j equals 1, this vector is just zeros. And we'll, we'll discuss this identification and normalization in the class. But it turns out that if you wanted to try and estimate this guy, it's not identified. And the interpretation here is that it's how utility depends on uh, the individual characteristics k for alternative j relative to alternative 1. So there's going to be one car that's our reference alternative. And then this beta jk says how the jth car, uh, how does utility depend on characteristic k relative to the base alternative. So the sign is not necessarily um, intuitively uh, informative. It depends on what the reference alternative is. The data that we have for this type of model is, this, is discrete choices y and characteristics uh, xij in the random utility model. In general, it, it's a function of these x's and parameters. And in the conditional logit, uh, the x's don't depend on i, and in the multinomial logit, uh, they don't depend on j. And the functional forms that we assume are almost always linear. So xj beta for the conditional logit and xi beta j for the multinomial logit. And when we're estimating the multinomial logit, we're only going to estimate from alternatives 2 up to capital J. How do we code all of this up? Uh, to simulate data from the multinomial logit, um, first we put in these zeros next to the thetas that we're trying to estimate or that we're choosing. So this is the normalizations. Puts a block of thetas next to a, a vector of zeros. Then we draw x's just as random normals. Again, it doesn't really matter what x's are once we, when we aren't assuming anything about them in the model. These are our v's, which are going to be n by j, the x, uh, xi beta j. And then we draw a uniform random normal, uh, a uniform random draws, and we take the inverse of the CDF of the uh, extreme value distribution evaluated at these uniforms in order to give us our extreme value type 1 distributed error terms. Adding them to the v's, we have the utilities, and now we can use the maximum function, u is n by j, so we tell it to take the maximum of u over the second dimension, this is how we use that, this, we have to put in this empty argument, and then it's going to give us the y's here that are going to be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and so on, and then the maximum utilities in the other uh, component here. Let me show you this in MATLAB. Um, here we go, let's uh, simulate from the multinomial logit model. Then this is what y looks like. It's between 1 and 5 because I've chosen it to be 5 alternatives. And x's, as you can see, they're also, it's a tall vector. There are k equals 2 alternatives. I don't have a constant here, I could have had that. Um, and uh, there are 100 individuals. In the case of the conditional logit, x is instead j by k, and we estimate all of the thetas, so there's no normalization where we have to insert a zero, and our v's in this case are going to be 1 by j, so we repeat them n times down, uh, because this part, we calculate that once, and then it's the same for all of the uh, individuals, and then this later part here, withdrawing the extreme value terms and adding them to the v's, is the same and taking the maximum. That's the same as for the multinomial logit. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Do it for the conditional logit here. You can see now that our x vector is much smaller because it's j by 2. And again, y looks, looks the same. And if we were to open up this function and, and step inside and have a look at what's going on when we get to this point here of calculating utilities, Let's do that, whoops. Then we can see that little v, those are the utilities for the five alternatives, j equals five, 
and they're the same for all individuals. So V is just repeating it down, and then down here we add uh, E, that's, that's our extreme value distributed error terms. We can uh, have a look at what the distribution of them looks like. The distribution looks like this, um, and then here we get our u y's as the uh, uh, as taking the maximum. Let me just run this and max u. That's that's just the maximum utility obtained, which we don't actually use for anything. Uh, it's just an output from the maximum function. All right. So the criterion function, what we're going to do in the class and talk about, I won't go into too much detail, is we derive this probability that y takes the value j. It's the probability that the jth utility is bigger than all of the other utilities. And there's some math that goes into this. Then we can insert the definitions of these utilities and work them around and it takes a long while to show that it's equal to this expression as I showed before. One, once we have that in hand, we can just take the log of this and that gives us the log of the probability that's the likelihood function. And the features of interest in general take this form when we take the derivative of the choice probability with respect to z that could be, for example, one of the x's, it's the uh, probability of this choice times the derivative of the, uh, the observed part of the utility minus and then the the w probability weighted average derivative of all of the other uh, utilities including j as well again so you can see that there's a component directly from the probability of choosing the jth alternative itself and then a component coming from the change in all of these other probabilities and how those utilities are affected in other words if we were to change the income of an individual uh, how does that affect his choice of buying a Tesla? Well, it affects the choice of buying a Tesla directly with this expression here, um, but it also affects his probability of buying all the other cars. So that enters into this. And typically, you can do this numerically. You can actually just go ahead and uh, and compute. Oh, whoops! Go into MATLAB and compute um, here. Once we have the criterion function, Q of theta hat. We have here, those are the log probabilities. So if we take the exponential function of that, uh, oh, sorry about that. No, there's no more, there's a minor detail. We can compute the choice probabilities and, um, and, for, and from those we can then go and change some of the x's and see how the choice probabilities are changed by that. So instead of deriving this, and typically you do that numerically. Um, 